my name is Benedict. Welcome to today's Mix Walkthrough video. Today our guest is Daryl Miller, also known as The Cube. I think that's how you pronounce it. Daryl Miller. I've known Daryl for know, 10 or more years online. We just sort of encounter each other. We both happen to use Reason, therefore we've encountered each other in forums. Turns out he's actually from Canada. I'm from Canada as well, but I left when I was like three, so I don't think we know each other. I encountered this track of Daryl's in, uh, in, in a Reason forum and he was saying he was open to having people mix them. Uh, he's starting to put together an album, I believe. I hope he's putting together an album because it's about bloody time. Strange random lists on, uh, on um, SoundCloud ain't an album. I want to see an actual real album. I want to see that from anybody, but I really want to see it from someone like Daryl because he spent a lot of time kind of not quite getting to that point. And Daryl has, has an agenda. Uh, whether I personally agree with that or not is not the point, uh, but he has an agenda. He has a, a story he wants to tell, a message he wants to put out there. And, and in my opinion, you can't do that with random bits and pieces. You need to make a work. I know that these days the fashion is like, oh, but you just, you know, you just drop random singles, man. And it's like, yeah, piss off. That's for like eight year olds. And if that's your audience, brilliant, go for it. But if you've got a bigger story you're trying to tell, that would have to be a book, not three pages here and there. It would have to be a book, you know, a lot of chapters and the story begins and shit happens and other shit happens and, and the end, hopefully, there's a happy ever after or at least a sense of resolution. And a record in musical terms, when you're expressing yourself musically, is that. So... Uh, Hopefully you get my point there, Daryl. The track that I chose out of the ones that, that he had on offer, and they're all kind of interesting, but the one that I chose was called The Spirit Calls. The reason I chose this is because it felt like the most hopeful of a lot. And I love my music to have hope in it. It's not like it has to be all new agey and new. As far as I'm concerned, you know, good death metal has a sense of hope in it. This one has a sense of hope in it, and that's what drew me to it. So we'll start with dipping through the track. We'll scoot in a little bit so we start with the vocal. This is Daryl's original mix. Inside with your fear and your pride, trying to decide. Isn't it strange Continual change We'll roll ourselves backwards and flip across to where we've ended up Feel your pride Trying to decide Isn't it strange Continual change So what you'll hear straight away is, is in the mix process Obviously, we've got a lot more level out of the track overall. It's louder. Um, I will actually now pull this up 3 dB just so that any further comparisons a little bit more even, Stephen. Um, otherwise, it immediately sounds like mine's better just because it's louder. And cool. That's part of my process. But um, it's, it's, a little, it's a little rough to do that. And I know a lot of ABs trade on that. Uh, you might have known straight away there's another instrument in the mix. It was always there. We'll discuss that later. Uh, but you'll hear a lot more clarity overall. Things come through and, and are a lot clearer. So that to me says that I got I got big improvement in the mix. Uh, I was about to say I got the mix right, but you know there really is no sense of I got the mix right. You know that, that's egotistical. Um, I improved the mix. While there's a lot of stereo in the original, it kind of feels small and introverted and, 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 a, and a bit crushed. Uh, there's, there's very little reverb. And I know at the moment these days there's this sort of fashion to have things brutally dry, but I don't see any beauty in that. Um, each to their own, but I don't see any beauty in that, um, more often than not. Uh, this 
track the spirit calls it's about finding the answer the song is a spiritual it may not be quite the same as swing low sweet chariot um, or, or that traditional kind of spiritual but it's still a spiritual I've listened to it that many times that you ask me any question and I'm gonna say the answer is Jesus and that's good because it means it gets in I don't even believe in the traditional church thing I'm an atheist if you ask me yeah? but it gets in and that's the job of this it means it's doing its work it says there's hope to be found out there that's working so we, we're helping clarify that so that's really again just the, the the AB of it you'll see that my mix is slightly longer I've added a little bit towards the end uh, we'll, we'll discuss that later and how that came about it was a happy accident so before That's all we need to do with that. Now I'll go through and I will play the final mix. We'll pop that. No, we don't need to save that one. I'll just show you quickly. There's a lot of tracks. A lot of tracks. Mixer shows us there's quite a lot in here as well. So now for people who've come across as fans of, uh, of Daryl's, here is my mix that I've done for his track.
Well, there you go. The Spirit Calls by Daryl Miller. Or maybe The Cube. I'm not sure what he's releasing this under. Uh, I'm really pretty delighted with how this has turned out, especially considering sort of the process that, that's occurred, not just from when I've had the track, because it turns out this track has been around for quite some time, and Daryl's played with it in various ways and actually had other people play with it as well, um, which brings me to the, the bit where I get to kind of pick on him. Uh, unfortunately, when this came across, you see I've got quite a lot of tracks, when this came across, a lot of these parts, like this and probably this and various other bits and pieces, including instruments, were all condensed into, into probably three or four tracks. So I had to go through and cut out each of these clips and put them into separate tracks, which reflected what they really were. So if we looked at Daryl's original track that we that he sent me, uh, you'd find that most of these weren't named like this. So a lot of them were called Extras 1, Extras 2. Um, and that's kind of not the right way to mix. Uh, it's not the right way to keep your projects. I'm not particularly having a go at you, Daryl. We spent a lot of time talking, and it was actually really great. It was really wonderful to have an artist who talked to me. I deliberately, as is my way with these mix walkthroughs, I deliberately didn't ask him how he wanted his track to sound or anything, and he was actually super cool. He was just, he understood that process, and he said, you know, I, I know your stuff, I like your stuff, man. Do what you're going to do, um, which is wonderful. So we talked about the background. That's how I got to know more about sort of who he felt he was as an artist because that's more important to me to help me express his song because his song is him trying to say something to the world and it's my job to get that out there but if you've got a project where you're saying oh well these are these bits are kind of similar so I'll put them all on the same track that might have made sense 10 20 years ago but it absolutely makes no sense now so if you've got this particular saxophone, let's say it's played by Margaret, then you keep Margaret's saxophone on one line. If it turns out that Margaret did various different parts which are designed to sound a little bit differently, you might even put them on separate tracks again. But it's common to condense Margaret's sax into one. I can always separate them out if I feel the need. But if I go to a track and I listen to it and now it's choir and now it's saxophone, now it's trumpet, now it's electric guitar. That's not mixable. Uh, also, the problem was that to solve those situations, uh, what had happened was that Daryl had gone in and used the, the levels on each of these. Like in each clip, you can change the level of the clip. But it's not really how you should mix. Yes, if it's your thing, you can do whatever you want. But my advice is always very strongly, when you're mixing, future-proof the organisation of your mix. Because you never know when someone might walk into it. As I joked with him, you know, you could be working on your track. Trevor Horn could walk in the, in the back door of your studio and go, Hey man, that's kind of cool man, in his British accent of course. And, hey, can I have a play with that man? And next thing you know, he's pulled out his electric bass and... Sorry, a jest. Uh, but you want to keep things as open as you can to allow for change. Now, what's happened with this track over the years, I don't know all, all the in intricacies, and, and as I said, I didn't entirely want to know, is that it's gone through various versions. It started out as an instrumental and it had various bits and pieces in it, which didn't make it through the end. Some of those decisions were good, some of those decisions I didn't agree with. Um, but also what's happened is that several tracks have been condensed, so they've been bounced down inside audio. So there are a few tracks in here, like this guy here, what he's called Spirit Funk, which in the second part I am sure is both a guitar and a bass. And if that's fan sound, maybe okay, but you, I, I don't think so. There are a few other cases where things have been condensed. Now, once you mix something and you render it down into one track, there's no unrendering it. 
So again, yeah, 20 years ago, I can understand why we might make those decisions because drive space was at a premium, but now drive space is really not at a premium. You, know, you can go out and buy multi-terabyte drives or, or get cloud storage or whatever. Uh, so do not make those kinds of decisions that are things that you can't undo later because it then limits your mixing options. And there were a few times here where I was limited by that. So not specifically against you, Daryl. Obviously, it occurred in this, and this has a long history of revisions and, and what have you, which ultimately kind of becomes some of the charm of the track, I think, at least from, from working inside it and understanding your process a bit better. Oh, but if you don't have to do it, please don't do it. All oh, right. So when I first chose this song, I felt there was a tiny bit of the Pink Floyd in it. As soon as I started working with it, I realized, no, nah, it's not It's not the Pink Floyd. It's because sometimes some of the later Floyd stuff is actually put together. You know, um, Davis pulled out parts of a recording from some other time and, and, and put them in here, which gives it that collage feel. This is very much a collage. The way it's written is a collage. Uh, I was slightly suspicious listening to it initially because some of the parts, they do kind of sound the same, but that is because they are the same. A lot of the parts, uh, not as obvious here, but when, when, when I went into the instrumental version, which is where I had the MIDI and, and a lot of the more raw instruments, are made up this way. They're made up of Dr. Octorexes. So they are Rex loops played back. In this case, it works. I'm always urging caution of building your musical platform on using loops simply because they're always going to sound the same. And if you say, well, Dr. Octorex is my guitarist and my sax player and what have you, unless you've got a steady supply of loops that are musical enough for you to turn into musical passages, you're kind of going to dead end yourself. Uh, so if you, you are a player or have got access to players, try and use them over just going loops. But nonetheless, what we have is a collage, and it's pretty cool. The first thing I did after extrapolating all the tracks and putting them into back into an order in which they could be properly mixed, laid out on a board and, and all of that, just my usual things, you can see I put things in order, and even if I'm not doing anything at the bus, which I largely am not, uh, I still put them in, so that way it just takes a little bit easier to say, okay, that's these things, that's these things, that's these things. All organisation, always work as organised as you can. I'm always saying that, but <laughs> I'm always not seeing it done that way. Uh, listening to the original, there was an instrument that really, really stood out for me, which was this guy. It's lovely. It's essentially a loop, but it's lovely. Daryl had pulled it out. Now, it's his call. It's his track. But if I'm coming into mixing it and I'm going through all the material that's there, trying to say, how can I make this tell its message the best way I can? For a song that's about hope, that's, that's the prettiest, most hopeful part of the track. Because there's nothing else in here that sounds as hopeful as that. So... Where you're trying to sell hope, believing in Jesus, the power of God, the power of the universe, the power of life, I don't care how you want to justify it to yourself, but there is that thing. We really do want to have uplifting elements in there as well, not sort of down-pulling elements. One of the other people who worked in this, you know, mix and, well, I've got to say, it's not how I would have approached it. It was all very war, and apparently it had an agenda with, the agenda politics of the song and, and decided to gut that and um, I think that Daryl had fallen into some of that as well to feel like oh I shouldn't have some of this stuff and you know what that's that's your your, your thing your platform you, you've got to be careful where you're pitching to a mainstream audience you know it's it, it's a fine line but a fan doesn't actually have to agree with all your politics there are, back in the 80s, there were a lot of bands who were raving socialists, or at least their music was raving socialist. Um, let's say the Style Council, 
Um, poor Weller, Mr. Miserable himself. Uh, but it was generally so well done that it didn't really matter whether I agreed with his politics or not. It was still great music. Now, the good thing about that is by getting me listening to his thing, his message, it still had me think about, well, you know, what's Thatcher really doing? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? His message got across, not because it changed my mind, but because at least it made me ask that question among myself. And that's, that's the important thing here. So if we want to sell hope, it's important that the elements of our mix carry those things as well. So I pulled this bit out and I whacked it back in. But because the check had sort of changed some structure, it was a little hard to know where. So I made the executive decision and put it where it felt right. There on they go, but that's not where but it was already a collage, so I've put it in where I feel like it's right. As a mix engineer, that is actually part of your job. I'm not the only guy that says this. Here are other guys um, who are good at doing this kind of stuff, and they say, no, this is your job. This is my job. It's my job to find the parts and present them. So we've got that. We start with... This big sort of ambient section. It's pretty it's pretty dark. I whacked all these parts into sound effects. There's only one part in here that sounds hopeful and that's the birds. If we were to kill off the birds right, um, sorry. Very mature. Oh, they appear to be there somewhere else as well. See what I mean? The same tracks have been, they appear in several different places at once. But if we kill off the birds, it becomes quite doomy and, and, and forbidding. And I know there are, there, there's that thing in Daryl's message, but if you, you want to show people where you're taking them. So the, the birdies. I pushed, I pushed up in the mix and I made more of them. I made more of a sense of openness. So if we look at how, just how I EQ'd these things. Just look this for now. You'll see that I was pretty aggressive on this. We just listened to birdies alone. Easier solo to think, oh, you know, there's, there's tons of cool material in there. Why would I get rid of any of it? But we've got deeper sounds coming in with the synths. What was important about this was them birdies. So I want to get them up and push them. Because that's their message. Let's not have them tell, tell lots of messages about low frequency rumble. Let's just have them tell their one message. The bells. They, it's, it's a tricky one to decide what the message of bells, church bells is. Yes, at times they can sell hope. Oh, look, the war ended. Let's ring the bells. But so often this kind of bell is, there's, there's an undertone of menace. Why do all that evil? So, hmm, meant that I've rolled off some of the lows. They weren't doing a lot. Push some of the body, because there's nothing quite like the body of a big bell, uh, and some of the highs, because we still want them to feel a bit bright. They're, they're, this is not going to be a doom metal record. Order. The other parts that we've got are noise with some birdies and. I'm not quite sure what's in there. There may be children in there, but there are several layers of it, and together it becomes kind of interesting. There's then a big pad. I don't know whether that was one synth sound with lots of layers, 
there's lots of layers. It, it doesn't perform a musical role ever, so I put that in with the sound effects. Had them all work together, and that's it. I put something else in on the same track as the preacher as well. I was a kind of a choir sound. I wanted those to all go together and work as a unit. I've even put in the initial vocal. Now, when we look at the rack, I can kill that, sorry, it's always hard working with, um, with one monitor. The sound effects, they've all gone through one bus. Except I may have still got something soloed. <laughs> and I've wanted to turn all those bits and pieces effectively into one sound, one environment. Even though there's lots of different bits and pieces, I want to make them seem like one thing. So one of the best ways to do that is what they call a glue compressor. Here I have used the M class. I've given it the longest attack possible, so it's really, really slow. But I've also given it the longest release possible, so its release is really, really slow. Uh, which means that quick things will come through, but overall it's going to give that sense of this belongs together. I've also given it an infinity one to one ratio. So it, it clamps down pretty darn hard while still allowing the, the sparkly bits to come through. So it, it glues the whole thing together without making it feel crushed by the wheels of industry. Sorry, Evan17. Uh, giving it a bit of the old echo, really looking to create more of an echo than a, than a classic delay. It's fairly small, a little bit of... Um, LFO movement, so it, it broadens some of the stereo feel, because obviously crushing is going to, to, to wreck some of that. A little bit of movement there just gives you that nice feel. So if we go back and bypass this, you feel like we've got a whole lot of layers on top of each other. Put that back together they sound like they're now one sound. So it was very, very deliberate to be kind of aggressive on that to sort of say, here, we've got this one thing, which ties together both the bright and dark elements at the same time. The other thing that ended up in there was actually the first part of the vocals. Now, originally there had been more vocal on the front. Daryl decided he didn't like it. I didn't listen to it. Um, I didn't think that it was necessary because he didn't think that it was necessary. Um, nothing grabbed me on it, so I didn't, didn't spend any more time with it. So good decision there. But this one... Floating in the wind. Floating in the wind, that line, well, it floats. It's not a, a solid kind of a beginning. It wasn't the end of, of some other things. Uh, it's not exactly there was a girl named Boney Maroney, but it's not the, the cornerstone of, of the rest of a track. So I've separated out. We've got our vocal starting here. With your fear and your pride. That sounds like the beginning of a song. So this little bit was floating. So I said, OK, we've got intro at this point. I'll make that part of the intro. So copied the track, created another version, put it in with the, um, with, the, with the intro. Now, all these parts here, those pads and things I've talked about, I did nothing to them. You can see because no, there's nothing happening. If it's closed down, nothing's been done with it other than the, the, the kind of EQ stuff that I showed you. Just to, to emphasize, to say, here's what this thing is doing. Uh, and then by crushing them all together, because it's focusing on, on what that particular sounds about, they, they do create this one sound without too much masking. The vocal for the 
intro part. Selig's leveler is just wonderful on vocals and, and other things where you don't want to use a compressor to bring the overall level and sustain up. This does sort of both at the same time. It's it's turning up the quiet a bit, so, and it, it does it nicely if you get it right. It, so it's it's a really cool device for this. I've then used Echo Bode, which is probably a bit of an unusual one to say that we're going to whack on vocals, but I've decided to transition that little bit of vocal into a sound effect. It still carries its words, but it also plays a role of a sound effect. And it shows us with that big echo, for anybody who's aware of this stuff, in the it says we're playing with some elements of dub here. By dub, I don't mean dubstep, I mean dub. So that's going back to stuff like tackhead. Um, it's ta 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 so that is Adrian Sherwood, Doug Wimbish, uh, Gary Clayle, um, the On You Sound system. These are the early guys playing around with tapes and samples and those dub delays and Jamaican style um, toasting. Uh, so we show some of our hand a little bit early and by putting it through a slightly unusual process, which is a frequency shifter rather than a pitch shifter, then it lifts it out of reality a little bit. Uh, so that's why that process there, because we're all sound effect at this point. You don't really hear the dub delay that strongly because we then come in with this lovely guitar. We need to do that because that intro is fairly long. In terms of if this is the first time you're hearing this artist, that intro is quite long. Um, if it were a single, leave that on the album version, you'd have to have a single edit. I don't see this as a single though, but I think it can make a lovely album track. So we give our sense of hope. In terms of the um, the mix, I went to the vocals, discovered that unfortunately they'd all been printed printed down. What he's done in terms of backing vocals, all of it was all printed, including reverbs and some delays and everything. We looked to see if they were original versions, but they weren't. Over the years, somehow they've all just con got condensed to, oh, well, that's the version I'm going with, and the other's been thrown away. Like I said before, easy to do, easy mistake, unnecessary mistake these days. But thankfully, I was not unhappy with the vocal we got, nor was I unhappy with the decisions that he'd made. I kind of wanted to do some different things with it, but I wasn't unhappy with what he'd got. Um, he decided how he wanted to process his vocals. Sometimes it sounds just a little driven or processy to me, but fair enough. The whole thing is, say, it's a collage. This whole thing is, is you know, it's cut and pasted together. It's, it's it's interesting. So that the vocal fits with that Gary Clayle emotional hooligan kind of thing. Um, so no dramas there. So I started working with the vocals and then really felt troubled by the drums. A lot of people will work from the drums and the bass up. I think it's a really unwise idea and, and most really seasoned guys who earn money, producers, mix engineers, know this already. You work from the vocal back. What's the most important part of this track? The vocal. If you're thinking what's the most important part of this track is the drums, man, then yeah, you, you're going to struggle to make a mix that tells the story right. So the lead here is the vocals. Went to the vocals, which meant that I had to go back to the drums because, again, Daryl had taken his drums and he had condensed everything into them. So there are different lines if we just solo this. It's 
so the separate parts I can't manage. I've got a drum mix. <laughs> That's it. The problem that I had was in terms of the mix, they were really kind of bright and overly detailed. So they, if you're listening to them on their own, just going, oh, how, how detailed are those drums? Yes, you'd, you'd be like, wow, how cool. But I'm, I don't want to listen to drums. I want to listen to what the songs are about. So I actually went in there and did the opposite of what you would normally do. I rolled off some of the highs from Pretty Low Down, gave a little bit of a boost in the mids. That's the area that everybody's going to be cutting every, everything else. So you're really quite safe to push that through. And it gives some of that samplery sound, uh, papery kind of sample player sound. And you know a little bit on the, the lows, but I didn't go too low on this. There is, there's not much super low on that, and I didn't want to go too low. Uh, again, because a lot of this stuff didn't have super lows on it, and nor did I see any sense in having big rumbly subs running through this. It just wasn't the way. So the first thing I actually had to do once I started working with the vocals was move the drums out of the way. So one thing was to EQ them so that we still have clarity. But they settle back into the mix. And the other thing that needed doing was that they had been panned outwards tremendously. Like if you listen to the original drums. They're horribly bright and horribly wide, which says, well, they, they kind of take everything over. And I don't want to do that. You know, that's not their role. So rolled off some of the, 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 the highs, because whatever's got the most up there in the air tends to be what wins in terms of the mind, because that's where we're looking for intelligibility. So I rolled that off and narrowed them down. They don't want to be mono because it's not a hip hop record or a classic hip hop record. Little bit of little bit of spreads okay, but they shouldn't be out here assaulting me from either side. So that was kind of the first thing that I did. And then once I've done that, it's like, well, I might as well finish my rhythm section, which was the bass. I looked at the usual, ooh, let's put lots of welly on the bottom end. And in solo it sounds nice, but in terms of the mix, the music it just didn't work. Whereas boosting here, which is quite high, it's 300, it's quite high. We're using some of the advantages of that, what I talk about all the time, of boosting your first harmonic, I'm boosting second or third harmonic or something, which tends to pull up the other stuff. But it gives that bass clarity in the mix, and that's more important for it to have clarity in the mix than for it to have... Also, whilst we're working on clarity, then gave it a little bit, again, around where the drums are happening at the 1K mark. So they're both allowed to, to sit right in the centre of that frequency spectrum. So that's my main rhythm section. Do you see, I'm putting it through one of these master bus compressors. The master bus compressor sounds different to M class, different for all, to get my grammar correct. Um, don't quite know why. Um, whether it's deliberate, I don't know, but it has a different sound. It has a more old school kind of sound. It's got a sort of 70s dirty old record sound, which is cool. In the right situation, it's cool. I've made a whole record 
where the only compression is this guy on the master bus. Um, again, I was looking for glue, but I was prepared to be reasonably aggressive. So there's my two sounds together. Letting it go to 4 or 5 dB, but a 10 to 1. So that's almost what was called the nuke option on a similar sort of compressor. Attack of 3 milliseconds is not slow, but it's not super fast either. So I'm, I'm moving fairly quickly on that. It lets some transient through, but it's not letting whole beginnings of things through before it starts to clamp. Wait, for the clamp down. The clash. Uh, and I've let it have its own auto. How the auto thing works, I don't really know. Uh, there isn't a lot of material that I've found that explains exactly what's going on in here. But you use your ears. Um, I didn't want this to be the fastest release. Whatever the auto does, it means it moves and changes. And I want these two together to feel like they move and change. So I've used this creatively in that way to create a sound and a feel that I want. That becomes the centre of this track. And then we're going to kind of clag all our extra parts of our collage onto that. Something that also came along with this was this spirit funk line. Kind of weird, a bit of a collage of sounds in its own way. I rolled off the lows because I didn't want it interfering with the bass. I deliberately didn't want a lot of bass, so I didn't want to interfere with what was there with other things playing in that arena, when really this is mostly about that you know, wacka 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 kind of a thing. So. so that makes our rhythm section. By this time, I'd learned all about the nature of the vocals and run through the options and, well, that there weren't any options. So I decided, look, I'm just going to keep building because there's not really a lot I can do with these, these vocals and I'll finesse them at the end as, as I would normally do. So I moved on. We talked about the, uh, the acoustic guitar. Very tempting with this to play on that sort of pin sharpness on top of it. You go, oh, it's an acoustic guitar. Let's, let's really use those highs. But you know what? They just spear through the mix and they sound, well, not scratchy, but kind of pokey, like sticking pins. No, not so cool. Even though I really want to feature that instrument, it, it needs to feel warm. An acoustic guitar can sound very hard and brittle, uh, or it can sound sort of warm and organic, and it's probably the most warm and organic part of this whole mix. Uh, therefore, we, we, we really want that to, to have that sense of clarity because it's about hope and lightness. It is the dove. Uh, but we don't want it to be sort of brittle and scratchy. So, rolled off the real highs, rolled off that point in the in the 1K because we know we've got our drums and bass coming through, and, and it always sounds big up there. There are times where I would deliberately use that, not that much, uh, but in this case I didn't want that, and I also just wanted to boost the body. That's the body, you know? wooden tissue box thing. That helps bring that sense of warmth out in this instrument. In terms of how it was processed, 
well, as it's already said, it's a, it's a Dr. Octorex. I kept its processing as simple as I could, which wasn't necessarily as simple as I wanted it to be, but mixing is all about working with what you've got. First thing was using the leveler. So we'll turn him off for the moment. Just turn off these two. Hear how it brings the overall level up. It doesn't turn the instrument up, but it just brings the overall level up. So it, it's, it kind of effectively increases the sustain of the instrument rather than it being sort of pink, 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 pink with the gaps between. It, it, it allows you to feel like you're hearing the, the, um, the string and the resonance of, of the strings and the body as, as we go through. So. We could do that with compression, but again, I'd rather do that with, uh, with the leveler, with turning the quiet bits up. So it brings out the nuance of that. A little bit of quartet. I like this new, uh, this new device. Gun. Sounds lovely. I deliberately went pretty heavy on this, as you can tell. But in terms of the mix, it's right down there. So we're just looking for a little bit more sparkle. And I've definitely turned the sparkle knob to uh, nuclear warfare level. Uh, this is the uh, the ensemble style patch, uh, but I liked the feel so long as it was subtle, uh, because I still wanted this guitar sound, even though it's a sample. I wanted it to feel like it was happening there in front of us. And then last, we've got our delay. guitar tends to feel very dry on its own. If you put a lot of reverb on it, then it just sounds washy. Whereas using the echo, and I've got quite a long timing on this, I went out to, to uh, a quarter beat, uh, a little bit of feedback, a little bit of diffusion, it just softens as it goes, a little bit of filter so that we're not hearing the, the bright pingy parts of the guitar coming back at us too much. Uh, very little LFO because I don't want to have this big old stereo any everything. There's a tiny bit of that coming off the quartet and a tiny bit here, but we don't need that much. And a little bit of wobble there. We're looking for not quite a perfect digital delay, but fairly close to that. And in terms of the mix, floating in the wind. You hear you don't hear the delay as much, but it just gives it presence and a place inside the mix. It feels like it's there rather than stuck on the front of the mix. Um, it's important that, that be very clear in the mix, so it's important that it sits with the mix rather than just being like whacked on the front like a smiley face sticker. Um, so that's that bit. The next were the guitars. There are, oh, um, before I forget, in terms of reverb, I put one master bus reverb in. I didn't want it to be a lot because there were some reverbs on quite a lot of things already. So I just used a room, rolled off some of the lows, not a lot because it's not a huge, it's not a hugely bassy track, rolled off a little bit of the, the, the highs as well. Quite a simple, subtle little room. So, if we're looking at our. Uh,
no reverb. Not super noticeable, but it just helps put everything into the one space. It says, here's our space. It's not a big room. Often I use big halls and vast amounts of reverb, but I write space music. This one wants to feel like it's got a sense of expansiveness to it, but it actually kind of doesn't. Otherwise, it would wash, and we do not want that. And as usual, where something's been put into a group, I turn off the reverb for the individual channel and just send the group. Otherwise, if you change mix levels, then you can be sending different ratios of signal to what's coming back on reverb, and then it can seem very strange. So if you're using buses, understand that once they've hit the bus, they become one sound and treat them that way. And that's one of the great advantages of buses. So we've got guitars. Now, there are a few things in this track that play guitars rolls, which is kind of odd. But it is what it is, and I ain't going to complain. So we'll put, actually, no, we'll just put this one in solo. Big, meaty. You hear the raw sounds quite muddy. Not unusual like, if it's coming out of amps and the like. I think it was um, Kwasa's Cream, Kwasa, how you pronounce it, um, which is which is a nice device. I don't own it, but I think that's where his tones came from. But you know, without being without being a purist, um, it's not like I'm listening to that thinking. Oh, that's done through software. It it kind of sounds like some of the, one of those weird black knobbly cabinets with a with a ghastly speaker in it. So to get it through the mix, see it's kind of it just modifies everything. Whereas if we pull this up. We've got our bass down here. Remember, we boosted that at 300, so we've got our bass down here. We don't need our guitar doing a lot down there. I've not rolled it off. I've not hacked it off, because uh, that would be unkind and unnecessary, and then we'd end up with a wasp in a jam jar, which we don't want. Uh, but I've said, well, what do we want? We want that. And so that's, that's what I've pushed through. The mix at that point right at the sort of two two and a half really push that through the mix so you get the feeling of the big guitar without it having to muddy up the mix that's about all that guy does next one guitars two is here there are a few of these there No idea how they came to be, but they're there and they're kind of cool. So that's the kind of spice that you do get with a guitarist. Now, I get the impression from what Daryl was saying that he can or has played guitar. Uh, so whether he played them, don't really know. Would be interested to know. So Daryl, if you want to share, um, Feel free to try put that into the, the YouTube box down below. Uh, nothing's happening on these guitars here other than very similar sort of trick on the Masters, which we'll look at in a moment when we get there. So the, the extra guitars. Then there are these pair as well. As you see, I panned them because they they happen at the same time as the um, as the main guitar. But in the context of the whole mix, they they sit in nicely. But I gave them the the tipped and down in kind of left right panning, and just decided okay. 
how we're going to play with our, our, our EQs. Yes, that one's in a similar sort of space, but it's more the, more the one, which is right in the, the middle of things that says, yeah, you're going to listen to me whether you hate me or not. That's that's a thing that you're allowed to do. Uh, so that's, that's our guitars, and overall in the guitars, once I put them into the bus, same sort of thing, one bus compressor. Pretty slow attack. And the release, nowhere near as brutal on the, um, on the ratio here. Um, really just looking to push them together. And by doing that, you get some masking as well. So when the, um, the sort of solo parts, the <laughs> bits happen, they partially mask or push the big chords out of the way. They just sort of go, nope, down you go just that little bit. So it helps manage the levels overall. That process is prone to dullifying things because your treble doesn't survive quite as well. So I gave it a bit of, uh, bit of a kick in the, the top end just to, to put some of the brightness back in after squishifying them. We then find some saxophones, which are like, okay, how did we manage to get these in here? But you know what? It's rather cool. Again, they've, I believe they've all come from Rex files. I recovered one of them. How cool was that? But it's in context that they really come alive. So to me, there's this great contrast in the material. Now you must decide, you know, which road are you going to take? Uh, are, are you going to live righteous? Are you going to walk the line? You're going to testify, brother. Or, or are you going to go back into the CD life? Saxophones often say the CD life, and this does that beautifully without being tacky. It's very easy to be tacky with saxophones. And that says that. It sort of says, you know, here's Skid Row. Uh, are you going to go upstairs, or are you going to go back to Skid Row? Uh, reading a little bit more later, it's <laughs> whether that was deliberate or not, it seems to, to very much match some of the... Uh, some of the story, um, in, in some of the backstory of the artist. So whether intended or not, I'm delighted that I read it and played it this way. In terms of making the sound, that's the original. We can hear the keys clack and everything, which is pretty cool. Oh, at this point, you probably notice that there's a little bit of a pop at the end. And you might be thinking, Benedict, why didn't you get rid of that pop? I only did it once or twice. This is a collage record. Whether it's intended to sound like a collage record or not, it is a collage record. So I'm not going to try and pretend that it's not. I'm actually going to take advantage of or play to that. So where you've got little pops when your when your section finishes, rather than getting rid of them all, I've left most of them there. And so Daryl may be like, but Benedict, when I gave this to you, all of these, you know, each one of these tended to be at a different level and they all had fade-ins and fade-outs. <laughs> I tell you, one of the first things I did once I separated everything out, was I did a select all. So I've got every single one of these selected. And I set the level to 0 dB, the fade out, and the fade in to 0. I wanted to know what I'd got. Uh, a couple of things are fixed, but most of it I didn't, which helps 
play even more to that sense of collage. You're probably not sitting there, well, if you're an average listener, if you're one of those people who likes to pick on everybody's work in forums, yeah, whatever, go for it. Um, actually, don't, because I'm not interested. Uh, you've generally got nothing of value to say. Um, sorry if that hurts your feelings, but I don't need you to hurt mine. Um, the, the, the feel that we've got by putting all these things together, some of that, that really comes out. I, um, I learned the value of that when I was listening to Kraftwerk's Man Machine record. This is going back a lot of decades now. I'm listening carefully to the record because who wouldn't want to listen carefully to that? And suddenly I realised I can hear noise gates opening and closing around sounds. My first reaction was like, that's no good, that's garbage, and they don't know what they're doing. And then, then I sort of faced the fact, hey, it's a classic record. It's produced by somebody who really knows what he's doing. And I can't remember offhand, so I could be wrong, but I'm going to guess it's Connie Plank. Um, don't care whether there is or isn't. Whoever it was did the record did a great job, even if it was a band themselves. Stellar job. And that's part of the charm of that record where you can hear noise gates opening and closing on, on bits and pieces. So seeing this is very much made as a collage, I'm not going to hide it. So long as it's not causing problems, I'm going to say, yep, guess what? We cut these things out of a magazine, we spread some clag on them and stuck them where we wanted them to be. Now, in terms of the processing, that I did on this. First thing I reached for was Scream. Ran through the different algorithms. Now I already know that brass and distortion are just best friends. Not when you overdo it, it's bloody horrible. But yeah, how it brings out the, the body and the detail of that, that sound. Not so much that way, but tube. It's just got that, that wail, it brings out um, almost a kazooiness, that's an awful thing to say, but it brings out some of the, the kazooiness of that saxophone, it gives a really really nice vintage feel to it. And then to pull it back in the mix, yes, we could do the classic thing of huge amounts of reverb, but I don't want to do that here. Yes, we're playing that card, but we need to play that card un in, in, in a slightly unique way rather than saying I'm just going to play a cliche because then it's going to be obvious, cut out of the newspaper, glued that there. No. So... Now, choosing Neutron wasn't a case of me going, oh, I'm going to get Neutron. I'm sort of going through going, yeah, it needs some kind of delay, but I don't want it to be the cliche. So I've got something which is kind of around that. I saw the Neutron and I thought, you know what, that's capable of doing some nasty things, but it's capable of getting some beautiful things when you get it right. can't say I'm super good at getting it right with this fella. It rarely survives in the mix. But I put it in, and you know what? It just sounded great. On its own, it sounds awful. But in terms of a space to put around it, it's not a reverb. It's a sort of a smearing of what's gone on over the last second just kind of smeared around and that works beautifully in here. It brings out that sort of seedy, everybody doing it to everybody else kind of feel. So it actually achieves that feel even better than if I'd just gone to the cliche. So again, before... So it, it adds a character to that instrument, which personally I was delighted about. Saxophone 2. I was a lot more brutal on this because 
It's essentially the same thing. So I didn't want it to sound like the same instrument. It needed to, to be kind of different. So the, the pair had to play nicely together. <laughs> With the main saxophone line, I pushed that papery kazooey sound. So with this one, I pushed an echoey, muddy sort of a sound. So I pushed it into this new filter, which tends to drive everything. Rolled off tops. So it was all what was what I did was already there. Let me turn this off. This one starts as thin. But I've already done the thin in the other one. I didn't need the two of them together. It, it wasn't wasn't a winning combination. So I've let my first sax go high and made this one go low. I know they're playing the same notes, but I've now made them layer. And this one brings in a kind of a body that the other one doesn't have. And let really wash. You don't hear them as two separate things. There's a little bit of panning. Not a lot, but a little bit of panning up there. The main one going that way and the lower one going that way. I often tend to put my melodies over that side. Bass loops that way, melody loops that way. It's not a hard and fast rule. Sometimes I change it, sometimes it doesn't want to play that way, but that's often the way it happens. So we've got really cool interesting saxophone sounds. Saxophone three, that's here. Oh, this is actually, I found where some or all of the saxophones came from. Now, this was already there. It was, it was only used once, and it ended up in saxophone two because the, the processing felt right. You know, it's like, oh, okay, we're visit, visiting that part of the space again. And then I found that this in the original. And I just thought, yeah, I want to use more of this. I mean, that's just lovely. This is a really nice saxophone squeal. But I had to differentiate it from the other ones. So where I processed the other ones, I took a different path on this one. And that path was to Beef it up and put the echo on it. So it sits under the mix, which just keeps reminding us that the vocal is saying that the spirit calls to you, Jesus calls to you, answer Jesus, take the high road. And at the same time, <laughs> the CD side is, is constantly still under their calling. For anyone who's gone through uh, uh, an addiction to, to anything, um, it's always calling. You know, you're all. If you've been an alcoholic, you're, all, you're always a recovering alcoholic. It, it, there's always going to be that point where you know Mr. Smirnov's going. So, not trying to be too political or anything, but this is the way that I read these things being there, and and I put this back in the mix. He pulled it out. I put it back in because I, I wanted to to keep making that statement. Just quietly inside the mix. Trumpet. Trumpet plays an interesting role here. It, it appears, well, I was going to say randomly a couple of times, not really randomly, but it, but it appears a couple of times.
as we come out of the break. To your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why you put there, I don't know. But you know what? It's actually really cool. I love brass. And, and not only is it a really cool sound and a really cool line in the situation, but it somehow transitions us back into the piece, which just stops dead in the middle so that we can hear some words from a preacher. Um, as you do. Here. Because we're coming to an ending in this section, now he, this is where he put his, his trumpets. I may have moved this one. I honestly can't remember. It's been, it's been a busy day yesterday. That bar, 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 bar. It, it suggests a hope. It's like he's saying there is an answer, and the music is saying that with the trumpet. So Jesus is the answer, and then we've got this really nice musical response. Jesus is the answer is the call. Now, he may see that as being the response. Whatever shit happens, Jesus. But musically, I don't quite know who did this, as I said, whether it was there or whether I put it there. I know that I definitely made something of it being there. I then turned Jesus is the answer into the call, the question. Because at the beginning, we don't really believe this, do we? Oh, Jesus. No. Jesus. No. So... When somebody says Jesus is the answer, your natural reaction is, I don't think so, buddy. So by turning it into a call, we've given a response there, and it's a nice calming line, but it's open to... to open our ears to the music ahead. And open... Pastor who says, hey, open your mind, try something different. So the trumpet's pretty cool. What I did to the trumpet was I wanted to give it a character rather than it just being a sample, assuming it was a sample, whether it was or wasn't. It's dry. So again with the leveler, just to, to make it more complete and bring up the body and the same very much with these. The, the leveler has a wonderful ability to to bring up a lot of the, the body because it's turning the quieter bits up. It, it brings the detail out in sounds without making them louder. Compression kind of destroys detail. The, the leveler actually improves detail and then just an echo. Oops. She's no wobble. Bit of movement on the LFO. I've actually gone fairly fast. You, you can hear how that sort of creates that kind of distortion that, uh, that you get with, um, uh, well, farting through a piece of tin and particularly if you're using something like a mute, which messes with the the, um, the movement of the bell of the instrument. So emulated some of that, a little bit of drive, just by using the, the echo, the, the delay there as well. So a bit of overdrive, a bit of flutter on the tape, it gives it character and it's a character sound so it wants to have lots of character next sound strings now these are strange strings for me strings are going to be all <laughs> but this is not what not, not what i got
these strings are almost playing an electric guitar line. Um, interesting. Uh, they do sound kind of dry though. Jesus so I figured So we're just using, well in this case a sixteenth, a, a slap back. So we just want that, that in the echo, which just spreads the sound out a little bit and, and gives it a little bit more, a little bit more body, a little bit more presence and sense of space without having to, because we don't want any delays or anything to, to wash this out into the mix. It still needs to be clear. Especially seeing I've dropped it a fair way back in the mix, because its repetition can be a little annoying, uh, but it still serves a purpose here. So in the original mix, in Daryl's mix, you'll hear he's pushed that, but he's got his organs back. I've pushed the organs forward and pulled that back. Different decisions. Um, I'll stand by mine because I tend to be the melodic guy. So it's an interesting one, and then we've got these what I call slow strings. I found them floating around in one of the catch-all tracks. Oh. It's a nice broad EQ to just just bring out. Kind of everything but centered on the 2K for clarity because the only role they play is in this lead up to the breakdown. So we've already got that trumpet playing those nice little sections, our call and response there, which helps us feel like there's hope. But then we've got these strings underneath. I don't want to push them too hard, but at the same time, the strings are just starting to give that sense of lift. Often as you're starting to do that lift, you're then going to go into the bigger thing. You start to lift, and then you hit them with the chorus. In this case, he said, no. Nope. We're just going to stop the track, and I'm going to play you this. But that's cool, because he's raised us to the point where we're starting to feel hope through these growing instruments, rising instruments, and then starts to show us something. So that's, that's cool. I like that. The slow strings, the processing is interesting. I think they've got some kind of processing happening in there already. So it was more about... just trying to, to boost them and give them a little bit of character without changing them too much. You start to process real strings, which is what I think these are, or were, too much, and then they start to sound processed and I wanted them to still feel kind of real that they had to carry a, a raw authenticity and honesty through the mix so pulverizer which I rarely use but I remember the old trick of using the comb filter to create a kind of a chorus uh, and that can work nicely on strings because harmonically fairly rich so moving a comb in amongst them you get an interesting feel Gives them a little bit of a little bit more stereo, so they, they sort of um, tiny, tiny bit of that movement onto the volume. So again, with the stereo, so it just just gives them a little bit more movement on the the, the outsides of the mix. Tiny bit of squish, tiny bit of dirt, so that they uh, they have character. So it's just that little bit of characterful presence 
that's being done there to pull them through. Then we get the choir. I think the choir may have come from a synth. I'm not really sure. Don't actually care to tell you the truth. I'm not fussy on where I get my choirs from. Sounds like a synth to me. Sounds like a sample. It's a nice sound, but it's it's challenged to make it fit in the mix. It's um we can do this to make it, it sound really nice, so we can we can boost the sort of the throat and and the air up here makes it sound nice, but then it's still somehow doesn't want to sit in the mix properly. So where things are causing me some frustration, I will tend to go to my friend's screen. As you see, using Scream adds a whole lot of garbage underneath. Now, we don't actually want that garbage, so it's been hacked off. The um, iPass filter in here doesn't cut it. It's relatively polite. I didn't want to be polite in this case. I just didn't want any mud in that base area. So it makes it a more characterful sound. It may be a personal like or dislike, but I just wanted to step away from it being an obvious choir sample and, and give it a character. This does that. Um, it, it's always going to be tricky to balance a choir like that in the middle of a mix like this. Uh, so whether you agree with my decision or not, fair enough. Um, I did play with the levels just a bit. So rather than controlling the level into screen, control, just control the screen itself. Um, could have probably just gone with the fader, but I rarely think to automate faders. Isn't it strange that you will change? Now you must decide. So it, it creeps its way in rather than just on here. Because I felt like it was very much sort of switched on. Now I think it might be one of this might be one of the ones where Daryl had originally, you know, done some sort of fade in. But I did mine. Um, I, I toyed with this, didn't like it as much as just letting it creep its way in. It's a sound that you could listen to the track lots of times and not even realise it was there. But remember, this is the bit where we're going up to that, giving that sense of hope. It does get out of the way here. Because we've got those strings and the trumpet. And they're more important, they're more powerful than whatever the choir is doing. So I let the choir recede at that point. It's done its job. Most of its job really uh, is kind of there within that. Once it's got to about here, it's not to say that it should be muted or that those notes don't belong there, but that's really where it does its job. And then the job is handed across to that trumpet and the strings, in which case it's wrong to keep it there when it's no longer adding an awful lot more. Organs. Now, these were here in the... Um, in the mix, but I've got processed versions, and when I found I could get the original versions, I was all, all over them.
presets. I get the impression they probably haven't been modified at all, but I didn't feel like I needed to change them. The pair of sands both have rather organy characteristics about them. Obviously fits within the track to have organy sorts of things. Uh, the two of them play off nicely against each other. Didn't feel like the need to change or didn't need changing. However, what I did want to change was that I wanted a tiny bit of left-right pan on them because the two lines belong together. I think in the audio that they were turned into one instrument, which I understand, but I wanted a little bit more control. So a tiny bit of pan, tempting to do again the tipped and downing pan and right, like, but this is not a sound that's meant to dominate the mix. It's a filler, it's a pad, it fills, and it gives more authority to the second part of it, because the second part of this track is where we're really pushing home that Jesus is the answer. You're troubled? Jesus. You've got Jesus. Yep, Jesus. Uh, so these provide that kind of authority to, to the mix at that point. In terms of what I did, as we all know, additive synths can be a bit So I've just backed some of that off. We don't want to get rid of too much of it because one of the cool things about additive synths is that they're... <laughs> but <laughs> we, don't, we don't want to overdo it. So I've given it some nice presents. This one in the, the, the sort of mid to higher mids, rolled off the tops. It's fellow, more in the mid to lower mids, rolled off the tops so, so that they can sit inside the mix more. In terms of processing on them, they've got the reverbs and delays, so I left them alone. But in this one, I, the first one, I put on a quartet. Parsec is quite a dry instrument, even with the reverb and delay. It, it needs some love. So again, the ensemble effect, reasonably short delay. Quite a, a small modulation depth, but we're getting starting to move into a faster rate. Um, tiny bit of noise. We're not looking to, to noise this up. Full width and 100% wet and dry. Processing in full stereo. So we're just not trying to create a Leslie, because I've got Roto. If I wanted to do a Leslie, I'd use Roto. But I, this is a synth. It's organy, but I don't want to turn it into a B3. So it adds a bit of width and a little bit of organic movement. The chest, you can say, well, it's a little bit B3, but it's a lot synth at the same time. This fella, soundtrack keys, same essential thing. This one doesn't sit there as, as long. So I've used a phaser. In with full stereo, a little bit of width, we're not... And again, just looking for movement, so if we kill that... Very dry, quite flat sort of sound. Normal out of pure digital synths. Um, you listen to a DX7 dry and you're like, really? So this gives it movement. The two of them together move quite nicely. The idea being that they, they sit, you can hear them in the mix, they're not on top of the mix, they're not leading it. We've got a vocal, we've got a guitar, we've got various other more important things like our saxophones and what have you. We're getting to the bottom of the pile here and, uh, and they just fill in and they do it nicely. that sound on the end. A lot of it comes from a guitar, but it actually sounds quite synthy. Now 
Now the bit that's different at Darrell here is that I added in these guitar parts on the end. Now let me tell you how I got there. As I mentioned before, if you've stuck with me all the way through, this actually came from an accident. When I first brought in these lines, I put them too late. And I'm listening and sort of going, yeah, that all goes nicely. And it gets to the end and we've got this playoff of the organs doing its, like, really from here. Jesus. And this is all in the playoff. And I thought, song doesn't finish properly. It just kind of stops. So I got this guitar, which I was loving, and at this point we kind of... We've got a really busy, full mix, and we haven't used that guitar. Remember, that's our kernel of hope. Now, the reality is, if we're really trying to sell Jesus is the answer, what are the odds are that we've really 100% closed the sale with about three minutes? Probably not. I used to sell automobiles. Could I sell a car in three minutes? Probably not. A lot of times people came in and they already knew this is a thing that they wanted to buy. They got the make, they got the model, they got the the, the colour, they got they got everything, even the accessories. But did they walk in and within three minutes be sitting there signing, saying, "Here's my credit card"? No, it is not in the nature that we that we do that. It's a failing. It's a failing of us that we've already decided. But then we've got to prevaricate. I referred to that process as winding our clock down. Now, have we converted people to believing that Jesus is the answer or that trusting in the way the universe works, trusting that God's on our side, trusting that life itself has a plan and that if we let it do its thing, it's going to work out well for us? Have we believed that in three minutes? Fuck no. I'm 50 and I'm still struggling with that, even though I know it. So I want to make sure that we're still offering our little olive branch of hope. So that we finish nicely, because we don't want to just, I'm done, leave the building. We want to encourage people to come back so that they can do it again. Because the more times that they hear that Jesus is the answer, the more likely they are to start to open up to say, you know what, maybe trusting that what I can't manage myself and just kind of putting it over to a higher power, maybe, just maybe that'll help. Bad for an atheist, eh? So I added that part. Executive decision, but I think it makes the, pin the piece finish far more nicely than just coming to the end and going, yeah, Jesus is the answer. I've solved all your problems. I can go home now and eat Smarties. This is all our intro stuff that we talked about before. Vocals. So it just brings us to the last part. I know this is long, but the whole idea of this is that I can walk you through and explain all the decisions that were made and believe me in a mix as complex as this is there is a lot of decisions this is why mixing should ideally not be done for like five ten fifteen twenty dollars because somebody who's been paid that little is not going to be putting this level of passion into it off my pleasure. i really like this second part the second part to me is it's the great part of the song. This is okay. Your fears, delusions, and tears. I don't like whatever he's done to his voice. There's some kind of, whether he's distorted it or whether it's just the processing of putting several voices together and electronic. I'm pretty sure he used polar to create some sort of harmonies. Um, don't love it, but somehow here. Visions of treasure, temptations and pleasure. That's nice. I like that. 
And it really plays nicely to all that stuff with the saxophones and what have you. It's a good line. Floating in the wind. Okay, there's our floating in the wind again. Show it early. Fears, delusions and tears. Jesus is the answer. Now, if you listen, you'll notice that... Jesus is the answer. Should never have taken it out, Daryl. So I had no backing vocals because they they were printed in. So go with what I got. And that is this. Floating in visions of treasure, temptations and pleasure, floating in the wind. So a little bit of processing Forget here. Your fears, delusions and tears. Jesus is the answer. Wind. Forget your fears, delusions and tears. A little bit of DS, you know. I actually have no problems with having a fairly sibilant vocal. I know a lot of people have a real problem with it. So I've DS'd, I've gone a little on the mild button, because uh, otherwise I often feel like DSing strips some of the coolest part of the vocal out. But Salig's DSer, it's a doddle to use. Again with the leveler. Leveler was designed for vocals and leveler just delivers. Jesus is the answer. Look up above for peace and love. Jesus is the answer. So just that little bit of keeping things even and bringing up the, the quieter parts. Because Honestly, lots of vocalists lose words. I guess that's why they call it the blue. Excuse me whilst I go get a cup of coffee, because I ain't never going to sing that S. So the level is really great for that. And then some people put saturation on everything. Um, I have used it on a few key things here. Um, I find it kind of compounds and sometimes it's a little excessive. At least for my taste. For peace and love. But Jesus is the answer. That that little bit of the saturation, which really is is a beaut. It's worth trading off an email address for. That that little bit of adds a adds a nice kind of presence and, and sparkle here, which is is good because this has been processed already and I'm trying to pull out the sparkle in it. So that's what was done to the... So many walls the spirit calls to you Forget your fears, delusions and tears Jesus is the answer Look up a... As you hear, there's already reverb there, um, that little tiny bit of extra. Yes, we end up with a reverby vocal all around, but I'd rather a reverby vocal than, than one that's drying up my nose. Um, all this kind of like... <laughs> inside songs, it's, it's, it's uncomfortable, it's not beautiful. Uh, backing vocals, I didn't have any. Sorry, I shouldn't, but I wanted to have backing vocals here. Because you know what? Backing vocals are absolutely superb, especially when you're trying to sell a message. God loves you. Do you believe me? No. Because you're just some git. Look, you're a fucking car salesman. I don't believe you. If I have five people behind me all saying, God loves you, you know, there's some social proof. So backing vocal, actually, to use um, terms from social media, give you social proof. There are other people who believe this as well.
He loves you. He loves you. Behind that suddenly gives that a lot more authority. What I had was what I had, which was only the ability to copy. So you'll see here, I've lost it. What feels versy, and then what feels chorusy. It's exactly the same. I wanted to be able to have other takes at least, if not harmonies, and spread them out. There have been some electronicalized harmonies put in there. Um, fair enough. Again, remember I said I, I don't have a particular problem with the decisions that were made. It's uh, the vocal fits. It, it, at least I don't hear it any other way. Uh, just made it a little harder to mix because I didn't have extra material to bring in that sort of choir or chorus of, of things. And I really didn't want to sit down and try and do a vocal myself. If somebody wants to provide a nice harmony and Daryl is open to it, I'll take it back and do it again. So what we've got, we'll turn off these. For peace and love. Jesus is the answer. Because I didn't have different vocal lines, different vocal takes, the only way I could do it was electronically. I don't love doing it this way, but that's the only option I've got. I used a slightly different de setting to start with. So many walls, the spirit calls. And I used this beastie. Echo mode, again, it's a frequency shifter, not a pitch shifter. If you use it in, a, in a, a, a fine way, a subtle way, then you get some sort of pitch shifting. But because it's shifting the frequencies, then it will slightly alter the timbre of his voice, which is what I'm hoping for, a slight sense of alteration of timbre. Yes, I could have pulled out Neptune and used the formant thing, but it would have sounded really auto tuny and then it's inauthentic. Robots singing to you about, about Jesus? Uh, unless it's Bender and Robot Jesus ain't gonna work. Doesn't work when they're singing love songs. Again, with the leveler. Jesus is the answer. I pushed it a bit harder on this. I wanted a bit more of a kind of feel to it. Because don't want as much dynamics on the on the backing vocals, then Jesus is the answer. So a very short delay, which is in the reverb territory. Feedback, bit of movement. So it's a kind of a very long chorus, uh, or a, even a um, spring reverb. Kind of a feel. It's all about just trying to to create a feeling of a mass of people, without going down the road of it sounding very electronic. You might say, oh, "Why don't you just put an ensemble on?" Because it's going to sound like I whacked an ensemble on a voice, and then the echo. Look up above, for peace and love. Now I've used the ducking setting here. Jesus is the answer. See, if that vocal's clearly exposed, then I might consider letting you hear the delay so it becomes almost like a rans. Soft kitty, warm kitty, little ball of fur, or uh, row, row, row your boat. I think you're a Star Trek person. You've done it at least twice, I'm sure, in Star Trek. Um, but seeing this is sort of the backing vocal and it's not being featured, then I've used the, the duck so that... Look up above, for peace and love. So whilst you're singing, you're not hearing that as well. It just minimises the mess a little bit. So collectively we end up with... Floating in the wind Forget your fears, delusions and tears 
Jesus is the answer. mixed back because we don't want our backing vocals to swamp our main vocal. We want them to push him up. Here's this guy. He's got something worth listening to. The whole idea of, uh, of your backing vocal. Um, again, the same thing with the compression. So, Jesus is the answer. Very slow in all sponsors. For peace and love. Jesus is the answer. Just leveling off and, and pushing them back together a little bit. That's the whole mix. That's the whole lot there. There's, there's quite a lot of little bits and pieces, and because it's very much a collage, each part had to be dealt with in more detail because that was a whole instrument. That was a whole instrument. That was almost a whole instrument. That was a whole instrument. Rather than if we sort of say had our guitar line all the way through, we'd probably go, okay, that's it. Oh, and there's a second guitar. We've got two instruments. No, because each of these has flown in from somewhere else. Sometimes each one of these instances is an instrument in its own right. Like these two are not the same instrument as that. I've put them together but I had to deal with them separately rather than saying, okay, that's my trumpet sound, I'll let it do its thing. I've had to do extra work. That's okay. It's, it, it's one of the intriguing and fascinating things of working in this style of, of production. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically it. So it's, it's a massive mix that has a lot going on on its own terms. But in the end, I think we've got all we've got these lovely little moments. So like the highlight reel there. Uh, but we've got all these lovely little moments that will make you want to listen to the song again. They're the reason I chose this song. Uh, if I didn't like it, I wouldn't have picked it up. Um, I picked it up because I liked it. And it makes me want to hear that again with all these little moments, which allows me to be fed the message. So I hope you've learned something from it. These are these are always long. This one's probably a little bit longer than some of the others. But that walks through every single decision. I don't think there's any other decisions that I made on this uh, in the um, six plus hours that I've worked really solidly um, on doing this. Uh, go back again, have a listen, have a listen to the ABs. You're going to hear a lot more overall level, a lot more detail, a lot more finesse, and hopefully you can understand the story and, and how it fits together in there as well. We'd love to hear your comments down below. Thank you. You have a great day now. Oh, uh, always the reminder, if you have something that, that you want me to do a mix work through on, please be in contact with me. Um, I don't guarantee to do everything that comes my way. Um, something I'm dying to have, if you happen to know somebody who's in a metal band, I'm dying to get a metal track as a mix walkthrough. You have a good day now. Thank you.